interpretation of English simultaneously. With uh, interpretation to English. So give me a second to speak in English for the attendees that speak English. To our eighth episode of Looking for the Center in Colombia, today with uh, Alejandro Gaviria. Uh, it is uh, Alejandro's first international forum since he announced his candidacy only a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're very pleased that he's going to be with us. Uh, we have interp simultaneous interpretation by Gloria Mejia. And so if you want to avail yourself of the interpretation, um, please just use the icon at the bottom. It says interpretation and you will get to enjoy her uh, stupen est estupendo or st her stupendous um, interpretation. Um, bueno, están entrando, uh, okay, más now we have more people joining us. I think we can begin. Uh, we have hundreds of persons registered for this event. And welcome, Alejandro. Thank you for being with us, especially on this first international forum uh, since you announced your candidacy. Thank you. And Sandra is always our collaborator. This is our eighth episode looking for the political center of Colombia. We've been doing this for over a year and will continue after this because for us, this is a very important topic in Latin America, especially for Colombia. And if you would like to ask a question, you can use the icon on the very bottom. We'll try to answer all the, cost, all the questions if possible. And for those that are listening to us in Spanish, please use the interpretation button at the bottom. And bueno, yo creo que no hay, hay más. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to, to begin. Oh, perdón, la interpretación es de Gloria Mejía. With that, no paisa. <laughs> so let's begin with Sandra. As always, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Ken, and welcome all of you. And thank you, Alejandro. I can call you now. I don't have to call you president, <laughs> college president. I, it's, it's, it's an, I remember we were in the academic council shortly and uh, we really missed them. It's, it's the truth. I, I miss you too. Okay. I'd like to begin with the same question we've asked all of the candidates of the center that's joined us in this series. What's the competitive edge that you provide the center? I heard uh, you in an interview in Colombiano that you would like to provide innovative ideas of what the center has shown right now. So what ideas of the center that have not popped up right now are the ones that you, with your candidacy, will provide. Thank you, Sandra and Ken, for your invitation. I would talk about three ideas. First, unlike the other candidates in the center, my position is clear on liberal topics. Not only because of what I've done in the academia, but professionally defending the peace. Very complicated, difficult topics that here and everywhere in the world, uh, talking about dignified death, a, a different approximation to drugs. It's, it's that more liberal standing. I think it should be part of the political center. I also think Sandra that I I have something else that I'd like to emphasize on, and it's what I call a, a strong uh, defense of tolerance of peace. I think that's interesting. And Sandra, knowledge of some social 
uh, topics that I experienced in the academia, poverty, healthcare, education. I have a big background on these topics, at least the other candidates don't have this strength that I have. I would also, I would, I can mention others, but that's firsthand my, of my initial answer. Okay, Alejandro. Every person that we've interviewed has had favorite or priority topics. You spoke uh, of 60 points. Um, and one is more epistemological and others are specifics. So which would be, Alejandro, your priority topics for Colombia today? And before, Alejandro, I'm sorry, I would like to add, and one of the persons that's attending that we can hear you very far away. So can you pull up your volume? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew. Can you hear me better? Perfect. Yeah. Let me get closer here. And let me answer your question, Ken. In the 60 items, there's not something that you could read of today. How I interpret this critical situation or time of Columbia. I mean, they're, 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 for those that are not aware of these 60 points, this is a way of how I had like my principles for social change. And my reading of today has three dimensions for everyone. First, the most serious problem of Colombia is social devastation. The unemployment rate is amazing. It's got to be with catastrophe in education, public education, and the incapability of the government to create jobs, especially for unskilled workers, those that didn't go, didn't finish their high school or go to college. That's what I call social devastation. The need of public policies on a short uh, term for social assistance, social aid, and a long-term basis. The second relates to my fear, and I think many share it, and it's the third peak of violence, the growth of violence in several parts of the country, the idea of quote-unquote peace. There's a territorial unsafety, the growth of murders this year, has been amazing. And that's over juxtaposition of the development and security are very serious here. And the third topic is the environmental crisis, the climate crisis, how we have to defend biodiversity and the productive transformation that we have to put into practice for the next 10 years in Colombia. These are the three pillars of my 60 items. And there are like telegraphs, bits and pieces. We're just beginning to build it really. Okay, I, I do apologize for the background noise. In that first topic of social devastation of rebuilding the economy of Colombia, I think one of the biggest criticisms you've received, and it's from the left, is that you're right that you're not a revisionist enough of the economic system and you don't, you, you don't look at the economic system deeply. And it's very hard because of that to give way to long-term. Um, it, it means you're too neoliberal for the economic recovery that Colombia requires now. How do you react to what the left is saying about you? My reaction is divided to two. First, I want to, I need to defend myself. And it's because of the role that I played when I was uh, the health minister. And I was obsessive about checking on the price of, of the drugs, of the, of the pharmaceuticals. And 
I was the first minister of the world that removed a patent from a pharmaceutical because of its price, not because of public health, but because of the price. I don't think that that's an agenda. That's entirely, I, I've been a criticism, I've been criticizing everything has to do with pharmaceuticals and the excessive zeal when it comes to intellectual property. So when it comes to intellectual property and the climate uh, crisis, we have to make huge changes. Yes. I have been an incriminalist. I mean, my background, Sandra, is that I am skeptical about things in Colombia. Now I'm trying to make that transition. I mean, there's a collective impatience to see how we can be uh, more compatible. I have a vision that's social de democratic as well. But I do defend the mixed systems. I think it would be inconvenient for to reform the healthcare system of Colombia, not being aware of a mixed system and that the capabilities of a society can be settled by everyone. So I am a reformist, a democratic reformist. That's how I see myself. I don't know if that answers your question, but that gives you like the spirit of what I'm into. Yeah, let me add another question. I'm sorry, Ken. Sure, go ahead, Sandra. Because, okay, let's be more specific with your answer because you're trying to set yourself politically, specifically, Alejandro, if, and you just said in your diagnostic, I mean, and unemployment is a big problem, particularly that of young people, which I think that the protest showed the absence of opportunities, clear opportunities, not only in education, but also entering the job market for them. But when it comes to these mixed mixtures, what specific proposal would you give us? Let me give you one. That it's, it's, and it's also diagnostic in Colombia for the past 20 years. Colombia has built a, a tax uh, structure and subsidies to capital that have created a type of economic structure and a private investment that has, that's high in Latin America. But, but and there I think we, have a, we could have a change. Less friendly with physical capital to boost the creation of good jobs. That's something important related to the economic structure of Colombia, especially in this century. Now, I mean, because now we have a lot of unemployment. I have been talking about this for a long time. It's, it's not because of the elections. It's, I'm not taking advantage of this. This is something that I've been thinking about and analyzing and talking about for a long time. Alejandro, you talk, you talk about the agrarian problem. You haven't mentioned it yet, but could you tell us your, your analysis, your stand on the agrarian problem and possible ways of trying to address it? Let me say two things about this. First, a diagnosis that's shared and it's that Colombia, perhaps after flowers, has not had an agro-industrial industry that's worth it. And that's how we are very different in Latin America. Brazil, even Peru, Chile, all have built agro-industrial stories. They have been able to be implemented in the global economy with those compared, those advantages that they have. And that's why, because Colombia had a conflict, yes. But it's also because of our failure of public policies in the agricultural sector. And there's a, a, a role that the, that the state should play that's important. The Ministry of Agriculture has systematically failed. I think there's a big challenge that we have to change the productive structure and build stories. There are some emerging 
like the Haas uh, avocado, but there are others like palm trees here, like arandanos. I mean, we have to build. And the second thing that I've heard from others as well, directly, is that we do need an agrarian reform. And, but it's not there because in those 60 items that I've mentioned, I implicitly take care or, or address what we have included in the peace agreement. The idea is to restitute lands, grounds for others. And with uh, forfeiture of properties, this is something that's very important when it comes to, uh, to land. So I wanna mention the touch those things, better public policies to have agro-industrial stories and to meet the piece, the items of the peace agreement. Let me leap towards the structure of the state. Many of those that we have invited have different theories about how to solve, if you want to determine the deficit of representative areas in Colombia, which is a problem not only for Colombia, but for Latin America overall. You look at the figures, 76 and 78% of the people don't feel represented by political parties. People feel that the government institutions, parties, and social organizations basically are not connecting, are not responding to the needs of the people. They feel like a famous disconnection that we're being talked about. It's a phenomenon that has always existed, but it's, it's much more serious and clear today. And several of those of the center have said, for instance, Juan Fernando Cristo, and he said, do we have to solve this? I mean, he's, he's a, he, he, he's not a friend of the Constitution, and others say, no, let's not touch the Constitution, because perhaps we didn't make a big change with, with the 1991 Constitution. But when it comes to rights, we did, and we can, it could be a setback to touch it. So I have two specific questions for you, Alejandro. One is the what, and the other is the how. What will you do change of the current political system? And what format would you use to produce that change? Sandra, when it, I, I talk, I'm quite skeptical about the, the political policies. I think we have to do something there. But I don't, I, don't, I don't think changing the constitution or the laws, no. I think, I think that's a bit deeper. And it has to do more with how we drive the policies every day, how the state relates to the citizens and how we interact. The role of the social media and the political communications. I think that's more important for structural changes and reforms. How I'm very skeptical of constitutional reform. I don't think that that will give back our trust in the democracy. But what I do believe in is that clientelism that we have in Colombia since the 50s, which has decreased the efficiency of the state, which has created that mistrust has, has got to change. I agree. I don't know if Sandra, you know of James Robinson, who talks about the democracy of Colombia brilliantly. He shows a geography of an ex-president with several politicians of the Caribbean region and saying, there it is. Basically, somebody in Colombia, if they want to be able to govern, they have to, to, to talk with these people. And I don't think that a pre president can solve everything by himself, but it, the president does need courage to go against corruption. From the campaign, we have to talk with realism to transform political parties. I believe in those dichotomies. Colombia chose clientelism, which avoided populism throughout Latin America, but really this has really decreased the role of the state and 
we're looking at this deep mistrust of the state. That's where I went to Chosa. So you talk about the how, it's hard, but we, we need will, we need the will. Yes, but a follow-up to that question. I mean, part of the problem, it's true that this has to do with uh, political culture and not necessarily changes can be made through transformations of regulations, but let me give you a specific example, which Chile has given us very interesting lessons. Parity, looking for spaces for women to, parse, to, to participate more in politics is something that we've tried to do many ways, but what we see is that the structure of the political parties in Colombia simply doesn't make it easy for women to reach power, uh, powerful positions only through their efforts, goodwill, and telling people that females are good for it. There's something in the rules of the game that seems to be blocking women in politics. I mean, in Chile, in the constitution, they went, got out of the political parties and immediately there was an avalanche of women to be part of the convention. So how can we attack this? Because, I mean, we're going to take more convincing certain sectors. Of course, they're more minority now that women can be good for politics, but there seems to be huge obstacles formally I do believe in parity, Sandra, even in the parity beyond gender, which I think is important. You can look at this in different dimensions. I was thinking, Sandra, about something different. You know about this more as a politologist. The Senate was, the, was seen as the response to the political problems of Colombia. So we played with the regulations, we changed them, and then we realized that the Senate is not good enough for this. I believe that this structure to protect the, the parties that in which we want to enhance the parties, instead it has created uh, tramps and confusions. I think that there are very difficult topics in which the how is even harder but political culture is, I think that politics are changing. I think for good with more direct participation, more contact with the citizens. Let me tell you a story, something that I've lived recently in these past two weeks. In discussions held with people on Monday, I was in Bogota for four hours talking with people and here I got my phone. And I'm talking with people constantly. And I think it's interesting because the, the politicians should be in touch with people constantly. It's demanding, yes. But I see a new transparency. I see young people more involved with more knowledge. I mean, looking at the positive side of, of this experience. Thank you, Alejandro. Leaping to something else, very different. But at least to understand your know, fundamental points. Going back to your 60 items, you also talk about drugs. You talk about proposing a scheme entirely different to what we have today. If, could you please tell us about your vision of how it could be an ad the, another question of Andres Lopez, who wants to know what proposal do you have to fight drug trafficking, especially in the areas where the state is not there? It's an ample question. When it comes to drugs, let me give you three things, my vision about that. First, it's based on public health, which I think is very important. Europe has been very successful with this and this should reduce the damage. And so this is public health that should be part of the core of this discussion. Second, I don't like the prohibition per se. I think we have to move to, towards a different regulation. And that different regulation in Colombia 
has two fundamental pillars. One relates to what will happen with cannabis, especially for adults with a different regulation, something that I want to promote somehow. I not only agree with it, but I want to actively participate in this topic. And uh, several weeks ago, we were talking about this. We could change the way how citizens interact with the pub, with the police and the public force every day. It could take away forces to the urban criminals. That's one in which I see that moving from the paradigm to prohibit everything and to, to check this is good. And second has to do with those that grow the coca, the farmers of the coca. I would I promoted the use of glyphosate because of healthcare and the legitimacy of democracy and justice and certain decency towards the farmers. I don't I don't think that we should place these farmers in jail because and to criminalize this activity. Because of that, so a bit, so that, that's something else that's important to me. And the other focus, or the other part, and Sandra is aware of this, is international policy. Colombia has to be a leader on this. So this has to do with how do we fight drug trafficking? All these words are perfect. I would say, I I don't like this this situation it leaves outside the emphasis on public policy it, it does not keep in mind that the interdiction and money laundering have to be the core of this not not the ground not the land it also says that the policy has to have the people in the middle i mean drug trafficking does create human suffering and violence i mean we've got people involved in this can I say, if you want, something complicated, because, and I want to explain it this way. While we don't have opportunities for development in Colombia, other than, than mining and growing these illicit, illicit uh, crops, we will have a very long path difficult path to create for many communities uh, of uh, many communities in Colombia, very poor communities, new opportunities. Of course, we have to fight against organized crime, which are killing today social leaders and uh, are, are really, people are struggling with them every day. There's a concern, yes because of the increased a dollar, the exchange rate, this increases the production of cocaine in Colombia. I believe that that's a good topic. Probably one of the most complicated topics for this government and surely will continue to be a hot potato for the next one is security. And this obviously is tied to implementing the peace agreement. So I know that this isn't very sexy, uh, a sexy topic, but please tell us what's your position on the agreements. Uh, what's, the, what's your commitment to implementing them? And more specifically, what would you do to try to solve the problem of security? How would you solve undermine those um, those gaps when it comes to presence and authority that FARC left in many parts of the country where the state has not been able to reach or arrive. So the big question here is, what do you have in mind to make the state reach those areas where it is it now? And because of its absence, it's putting at risk social leaders, organized communities and others. Let me begin with the first part of, of the question. My commitment is clear. And I have a vision of the peace agreement beyond peace. The equation of peace is like territorial equality. Peace is like trying to close those gaps in Colombia. 
the modern part and the rest of Colombia, which has been defined in us as a nation for many years. I believe that those first two chapters of the agreement of rural development is something that we have to use, put into our public policies, but it's a long-term vision. To close those gaps in, in Colombia, territorial gaps is, is hard. Part of the security has to do with this, with those inequalities that we see because of the absence of developments in different parts of the country. But there's something else that worries me a lot, and I'm getting involved in it a lot, because of the police and the public force in Colombia, there's a lot of passivity. And I think that that relates somehow with the social leaders. The public force has to be throughout Colombia, protect the population and be less passive. I've heard stories about the, the army being passive. And that has to change. Alejandro, it's me again, sleeping to something very different. It's hard to be a presidential candidate, really, from one topic to another. Well, let's go ahead. Yeah, it's that we're receiving many questions. Very, very good question. That's good. And they're very good questions. Okay. Going back to something fundamental that you talked about initially comes from Ana Maria Mejia, and it's about climate change. Yes. So her question is, what are specific actions that you propose for climate change? And the second, it, there is no education uh, in Colombia about this. People don't know what it is and therefore what to do individually to mitigate this, two things. To mitigate climate change, is that a bit quite, that one of the questions? Yeah. Well, how can you improve the education for people on climate change so people can help know about it more and can take, make, take measures and act upon this? One of the biggest problems of climate change is that people is not emotionally connected to this topic. If it's a war, everybody's connected to it. But with climate change, there's still this passivity also. I remember a phrase I read, it's not that we deny climate change, it's, it's that we, our behavior is that we're trying to avoid it. It's not what a government does, but the education is also very important on this topic. We have to do a lot. And we can do a lot. I mean, when we, when, if the president talks constantly about climate change, making use of the cameras and the microphones and everything, I believe in that, that the words do matter, whatever the president says and how, and the priorities of the president are, are that can lead to something. When it comes to climate change, we have to make a differentiation. First, we have productive transformation policies, how the uh, Colombian economy has to leave aside coal as of now. I, I would say as of now, I remember I asked a banker and, uh, and I think that the, and the discussion is when we're gonna finish with coal and produ producing with using coal. Of course, it requires different incentives and a type of, of conviction by the private sector because it's got to change to build different stories. But they require incentives and public policies. The other topic that I'd like to differentiate is the energy transition. I think we're advancing good. Uh, we're, uh, Colombia is making commitments. There are difficulties, yes, there, but there's agenda or is set forth and the world is headed towards that as well, advancing quickly towards this transformation. There's a third thing that really worries me. And I think it's the biggest global responsibility of Colombia and it's to stop, it's, it's to protect the Amazon and protect biodiversity. 
it's we're, we're not big globally when it comes to the mine coal mines but we are in biodiversity we have the amazon it's a treasure for the world and if we don't stop this uh the the we have got to be obsessive about taking care of this i am going to travel with rodrigo botero as soon to chile to get there and lastly it has to do with adaptation and mitigation policies per region. I would like to divide this topic in like productive transformation, the power, deforestation, public policies, adapting. And in 10 days, we will be presenting a document on this matter. Thank you, Alejandro. Sandra, I'll I'll take a leave later. <laughs> I, I mean, Alejandro knows uh, he's going to have to touch a bit of everything. Prepare yourself, embrace yourself. <laughs> yeah, Alejandro can show that he's an expert in everything. That, that's why I'm leaving. Right now, I would like to take a step back and say this. The task of a president cannot be of being a, an expert in everything. He's got to have knowledge, yes, but principles, a way of making decisions, having a good team, and at least having an understanding of the complexity of the state. My vision of the world is what's shared by anthropologists and economists. It's not in the head of the government only. I think we need knowledge, yes, but we have to understand the role of the president. It's not to know a bit of everything. Instead, it's, 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 and it's not trying to solve all the problems every Saturday with the community. No, I don't, I don't believe in that. The government and, or, uh, and the president, I mean, the figure's different. You're not going to make community councils to solve all of your problem, no. To have adult conversations with society, yes. There could be a political efficiency. I was being sarcastic, Alejandro. I can't be an expert of every territory. No, there's no way. Okay, that, that, that helps. Let me propose you and Ken that for the next meeting, next minutes, we can talk about two things. One is fundamental for me, and I understand that this isn't something sexy, but still, let me take advantage. Uh, it comes, uh, sexy comes from after. I want to know, which are the sexy? The less sexy is foreign policy. And there's somebody in the audience that's asking about this as well. Yeah, sure. And the other, is your role in the coalition of the center, which is a bit sexier. Yeah, Sandra, there's a topic. People don't like the mechanics of politics, but really deep on the very bottom, people, people do want to know about the techniques, the alliances, coalitions, but it's healthy for them to worry about that. There's some, some political institution that, and that's good. But let me, under, let me begin. I mean, you said that you are liberal and you represent liberal ideas in the conceptual uh, term. So I'd like to ask you two questions because part of what I try to decipher in the interviews made before is what does it mean to be liberal for foreign policy? I mean, it's, it's we know what somebody does on the right or the left or what they think in terms of international matters, but it's not, there's not a, we don't have a liberal platform regarding foreign policy of the question. And the first question here, one, what's your position when it comes to Venezuela and its regime? And second, how do you think we can solve the Venezuelan crisis and what's the role that Colombia can have to solve it? That's a difficult question because if you look at this 
through, through a liberal, there are two things. We, as a liberal, think about uh, it, a good, healthy economy, and that's far from what we see in Venezuela. But this, we have to be pragmatic here. Colombia should play a major role for the, in the Venezuelan crisis. We should all be sitting there. I think the migration has increased the importance of uh, being pragmatic and to have open discussions with whoever governs um, Venezuela. We have to be pragmatic, defending democracy, of course, and international forums, having a strong position that you have to be democratic and you have to practice it, but that doesn't mean that you aren't pragmatic with uh, regards to Venezuela. I remember that Juan Manuel Santos did it in his government. He criticized the Venezuelan regime, but they were allies still. The peace was uh, something important. That's a general question. I see how liberal ideas, but we do need a pragmatic focus to conciliate all this. So just to follow up, this means that initially you agree that the, the famous crisis of Venezuela will need a negotiation and not a military intervention, right? Yes, I think it's crazy, an intervention that would destabilize. I believe that, the, that an intervention like what they did with Trump, I think, I think it was a big disaster. So if you were one of those debates uh, on TV and somebody asked you, do you think that Venezuela is a dictatorship? Would you say yes or no? Yes, yes. A dictatorship that we have to be pragmatic about. Yes. You passed the test. Let me step back a minute because really, I don't know if now, but if somebody asked me on TV and on DB and in a debate, I would say, I, I would say words matter. To have definite ruptures, insulting others, is not a win-win situation. I would avoid those types of confrontations. And I mean, we have to understand the setting. I think that words matter. And somebody that's a presidential candidate has to be very careful on how they refer to the neighboring countries and how they handle their matters. I would be very careful at least. I would be a serious candidate. It's, it's not easy to to solve because those that have been victims of many political, social, and economic violations in Venezuela also should be internationally acknowledged. They expect solidarity, yes. But yes, but the bottom line, if you look at this on a long-term basis, uh, you, you look at the, at the well-being of Venezuela's people, it's convenient for them to have a different way out. So it's a pragmatism that they would understand. Because here we have a uh, vision thinking on the medium term uh, well-being uh, of Venezuela and Colombia. But we have to be very careful, okay? I was going to talk about justice, but it's not sexy, right? Or for Alejandro? No, it's not sexy at all for me. <laughs> it, it's good to be sexy, but th that's that's just that. It's it, but it is important as an attorney. I, I I don't know if I agree with you, but it's okay. So let's talk a minute about this question. The question is, how can you enhance the justice system? And knowing the gentleman that's making this question. I think that the premise is that we've seen the politicization of the fiscal's office 
and the judiciary branch. I think he's talk, thinking about the Fiscalia. So how can you enhance the justice system, Alejandro? Let, let me pick up on what you asked, because enhancing the justice system has to do with deep reforms, the role of courts. I mean, it's, it's, it's vast, but I want to focus on something that really worries me. And that I worry about the Fiscalia and it's, it's a general concern. It has to do with the uh, control bodies of Colombia, the lack of autonomy and how those institutional weights, heavyweights have been degrading. And this is something that we should worry about. I think that we see an impairment of these bodies in this government. And it's something that a president that respects institutions should do to go for that independence, their autonomy, and make them as, as, as uh, that the consultation of power in any case is good. And that Colombia has an institutional um, design in its spirit. So I worry about the Fiscalia. Perhaps uh, I'm talking about this question, investigations made against uh, politicians and uh, that we all should really be concerned about. Okay, now let's talk about sexy. <laughs> As Ken says, there are several questions really. You're, you're gathering signatures, right? Yes, Sandra. Since I, I, I'm poly lovely. I'm poly loving everybody. It's, it's, it's a good word. Good word. Good luck with that. Good luck with that one. Uh, that's a tough one. I really wish you good luck with that. <laughs> so the question is now, now really, do you know if you're going to be part, are you going to be part of the coalition or not? I don't know for the coalition of hope because nobody in Colombia knows who will be the candidate and for, for this coalition. The liberal, liberal party is, is another opportunity. So I have a responsibility now to enhance my ideas, talking with the people, to be part of the coalition really isn't something for me, but I am aware that part of my functions by March is to join the center to, because otherwise it would not, it would be counterproductive. The idea, so let, let me ask you a bunch of questions more. I need more precision for me. When you say that you don't know what's the name and surname of who will lead the coalition, do you, are you saying that who, that the central um, candidate will, will be from one party or another? I mean, what do you mean? No, I think that the consultation within that center will be interesting, yes. But my inspiration is to collect the signatures, not only, and to be backed not only by one party, but by several. There, I haven't had these conversations yet. I think it's boring to talk about alliances and coalitions as of now, people don't know me well yet. I'm building my ideas. I'm showing what I think, uh, what's my, what, what do I think about this time and age of Colombia, the exclusions, the peace agreement, I mean, that's where I want to emphasize, that's what I'm emphasizing now. So if you agree with what I'm saying, tell me. Anyways, the political party that you identify more is the center or the 
coalition or are there other politicians or parties that are interesting for you? New, new, neoliberalism is interesting. There are pro, and there's trust uh, that I have in those there. And, uh, some I like from the coalition, some don't like me. Oh, really? Everybody likes you. Uh, now there, yeah, the flirt, the, there's, there are flirts of flirts. The, yes, yeah, that's how love is, right? Well, I've thought in, in these days, uh, I've thought about a phrase. It says, there's no love here, but we can invent it. That comes from love from times of cholera. And the possible relationship of yours with Congress, if you're the president, how, how do you see the list? And you know that in Colombia, governing without the, the Congress is practically impossible, especially if, if you're called a reformist, if you need big changes. A, a good, decent uh, structural tax uh, reform hasn't been seen for many years. But Sandra, there's something I haven't addressed yet. And uh, it, it's Congress. I have no idea. People don't know my participation. I have no idea who fo will follow me or not. Um, alliances with Congress people, I have to acknowledge that I haven't even touched Congress yet. I still haven't done anything with Congress yet. I can't answer. Ken, I think that we can end with this question, Alejandro. And it's close to your heart. It says, how can you try to convince young people and young adults, 30 to 40 years old, they can even be younger, that the country will change and avoid the exodus of a of, of brain. Because now there's a, people are losing their trust in Colombia. And I think we're reaching uh, apocalyptic levels. Yes, the person is right. When I look at the surveys, there's a loss of trust in institutions, but also in the media. And from the very beginning, I've emphasized this, the need of, the, of creating new stories about Colombia. I mentioned some, the colonization of Antioquia and coffee that modernized the country, the female revolution in the 50s, the constitution in 1991, that created a country that's more inclusive, the pro peace process, we need a new story to build Colombia. And I've got some ideas. One, today, Colombia, its place in the world is based on biodiversity and the cultural that protects and celebrates the biodiversity. I, how can we create a different story full of hope? And to tell people clearly that that transformation and to recover our self-esteem as a country, not only depends on one person. It's a job for everybody. Part of my task these days will be that. Generating trust is fundamental. But this is a story that we're going to build. It's a story that in which I want to enthuse, make the, our young people more enthusiastic. Yesterday I received uh, an email from Wade Davis. He's a friend of ours as well. And when I read his first pages, there's a, a love letter to Columbia, really, written perhaps uh, in, a, in 2018 when there was more optimism, but it could be rescued and brought to today. Perhaps there is a force that, that I have. You can learn, you can talk about poly, uh, public policies, but I don't want to be the, the, the candidate of one economic uh, situation. No. 
the, I think the essential problem of Columbia is that today, and really always has, has not believed in itself enough. It was born despite itself, said a historian once. Being, being a Colombian, it's like an act of faith, like a story of, of Borges. I remember the Posada talked about this. It really depends on what happens with our country. In the next 10 years, I remember to, that I returned to Colombia in the year 2000. And Colombia back then was losing its educated middle class. 20, 25% of the professionals left. Now they're coming back, but they're losing hope again. I think that part of my task will be that on the margin, modestly, but with enthusiasm to regain and recover that trust. Thank you, Alejandro. We granted a, a, pr a prize to Wade in, in a gala and he's a great friend of ours. He from Canada has taught us how to love Colombia. He's a big friend of our Canadian Council for the Americas. I would like to make get a commitment from you. I am getting tired of seeing candidates arriving to their debates wearing jeans. I would like to know if in the next debate. Are you going to wear pants for an adult pant instead of jeans? I mean, could you commit to that? Yes. I mean, I think that jeans look good. I don't share what you're saying, Ken. I promise now, Ken and Sandra and everybody else, not a pant, a wool, wool land, but a khaki pant. Yeah, khaki, it's a higher level at least. Yeah, but khaki is okay, right? Uh, it's better. It's better than jeans. It's it's not a hundred percent adult and formal, but it's okay. It's better than jeans. Alejandro, don't let him. He's going to ask you the next time to to comb yourself, and that's too much. Yeah, I have a problem with my hair. I confess. I, I got sick and I lost my hair and grew back and it's unmanageable, but there I go. I'm not going to do to this guys as a candidate. I will my, my khaki, an iron shirt, and new, and new uh, shoes. I don't know if we can see your camera, your pants in the debate. A jacket would be good. Yeah, it depends. I mean, jackets, for me, it's exaggerated. At least not a tie. No, no tie. Come on, Sandra, let me, at the University of Los Andes, I made a change in, in the president's office. You enter pictures, all of the, of the presidents, which have all been made, and they all have a tie, but my picture is without a tie because I never used it. It's wonderful. A picture without a tie as the president of that university. Ken, what do you think? Do you like ties? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Especially if there's a debate in the coast. Of course, you're not going to wear a tie. I still have the nightmare uh, Vargas Lleras, white pants four years ago and then debated. I don't sleep, I don't sleep well yet with that image. <laughs> That's, I swear before you and everybody else that I'll never wear white pants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I don't know if, if this was the ending that we planned, Sandra, but there we are. Alejandro, thank you so much. And for those, attending this discussion was taped and um, will be on our website this afternoon or tomorrow at the latest ccacanada.com. Uh, and there's a lot to, to do before the next folks. And Sandra, Alejandro, thank you. And I hope 
we can talk again ahead. Sandra, I miss you as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.